Hey everyone, welcome to the third video and maybe the last in this series of notorious computer malware that have infiltrated industrial systems globally, posing a serious challenge to cybersecurity professionals across the globe. Remember, we have started this series with Stuxnet Worm, and if you didn't see this video, I will leave the link in the description for you to, to view. And Stuxnet severely affected the Iran nuclear capability by slowing down the centrifuges in their nuclear reactors. Then, in the following video, we discuss about Dukyu, this dangerous malware, compromised zero-day Windows vulnerability in industrial systems to glean crucial information and work as an espionage tool. In this video, we will discuss another malicious software known as Flame, which is perhaps even more dangerous than Stuxnet and Dukyu. So let's begin. So what is Flame? In simple words, Flame is sophisticated attack toolkit capable of infecting numerous computer networks simultaneously and gathering sensitive data. This malware uses the computer network facilities to relay massive amounts of information. Well, that was a simpler way to describe it. However, this cyber threat is not so straightforward as Kaspersky considers Flame is a malware perfect storm, a dangerous combination of a backdoor, a Trojan, and a computer worm at the same time. So let us understand what Kaspersky intends to convey. Flame is a backdoor because it uses an alternative way of tapping into sensitive information by passing the proper authentication channels. It is a Trojan because it disguises itself as a legitimate file and masquerades as a routine Microsoft software update. Finally, it also qualifies as a worm because it replicates itself after infecting a host and spreads to other systems in the network if prompted by the attackers. So what does Flame do after infecting a computer? Once it infects a computer, Flame carries out five primary activities, which are activating its microphones and cameras, monitoring user keystrokes, third, extracting geolocation data from saved images, snapping screenshots of functioning computer, and last but not least, using Bluetooth to send data and receive comments. So who have been the targets of Flame? And Flame has infected systems in Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Sudan, Middle East countries, and North Africa. But wait, does this style of functioning ring a bell? Is there any similarity between Flame, Stuxnet, and Dukyu? Like Dukyu and Stuxnet before it, Flame's geographical scope of its infectious and behavior indicates that it is a state-sponsored toolkit specializing in espionage and making it as another instrument in cyber warfare growing arsenal. The flame looks like a parallel project created by people hired by the same state-nation combo behind Stuxnet and Dukyu. Eugene Kasparsky, the CEO of Kasparsky Lab, believes that Flame appears to be another cyber warfare strategy, but is different from Stuxnet and Dukyu. So how is Flame different from Stuxnet and Dukyu? Let's see. Flame's characteristics is its 20 megabyte size, which dwarfs Stuxnet at 500 kilobyte. Flame compromised six models, multiple libraries, SQLi3 databases, different encryption levels, and 20 plugins for enhanced functionality. Interestingly, the code is written in LUA, 
programming language that is not commonly used for writing malware. Generally, malware compromises small files written in compact programming language, making them easy to hide. However, Flame was a trendsetter with large amounts of code written in uncommon language. Another new feature was its ability to steal data differently using internal microphones and Bluetooth devices. Flame has different configurable options. For example, it can discover Bluetooth enabled devices near the infected machine and collect the data. At the same time, it can convert the infected machine into a beacon and make it discoverable through Bluetooth. Flame is different from Stuxnet because it does not replicate automatically. By default, the spreading mechanisms are switched off. It spreads only when the attackers switch them on. However, it disables the USB exploit after infecting the USB stick inserted to the machine. Besides controlling the spreading of the malware, it reduces the chances of detection. At the time of its discovery in 2012, Flame was the most complex threat ever discovered. Its massive size enabled Flame to remain undetected for two years. While Flame appears to have been functional since 2012, some clues indicate that the threat could date back to 2007, around the same time when Stuxnet and Dookie were created. Maybe the automatic spreading functionality was present in the early versions of Flame but they were disabled after Microsoft patched the ink and print spooler vulnerabilities in September 2010. Flame checks for updated versions of antivirus programs, depending on which it determines if the environment is conductive to spreading the exploit. So how was Flame detected initially? And Kaspersky Labs received a request from the UN International Telecommunication Union to investigate reports of malware affecting computers belonging to the Iranian National Oil Company and the Iranian Oil Ministry. This malware, named in local news article as Viper or Wiper, stole and deleted information from network system. On searching through their archives, Kaspersky found an MD5 hash and file name deployed only in the Middle East countries and Iranian machines. One discovery led to another, and finally, they pieced everything together as part of Flame. And what was the reason behind this unique name? So Flame gets its name from one of its modules, a critical one responsible for attacking and infecting various machines. So how does Flame infect machines? Flame uses two models for infecting USB sticks, how to run Infector and Uporia. The outrun.inf method uses the Shell32 DLL trick, the same as used by Stuxnet. Uporia uses a junction point directory containing malware modules and an LNK file for triggering the infection after the directory is opened. Besides, Flame can create replicate through local networks, through the printer spool vulnerability, MS10-061 exploit by Stuxnet, or by performing remote job task, or when a user with admin rights executes Flame, it can attack other machine by creating backdoor user accounts with predefined passwords. Though Flame has not displayed any explosion of zero-day vulnerabilities like Dookie, it has affected fully patched Windows 7 systems, indicating the risk of zero-day vulnerability exploits. So let us now see how it finally steals information. And initially, Flame eats the network system with a six megabyte component that contains six compromised modules. The primary component extracts, decompresses, and decrypts the half a dozen modules and writes them to different locations on the disk. Once all the models are unpacked and loaded, Flame connects to one of 80 
command and control domains to collect information and deliver it to the hacker. Then it awaits for instructions from the controllers. Besides, it compromised an updatable list allowing the attackers to add new domains. While Flame waits for further instructions, the other modules sniff the network and collect the screenshots. Generally, the frequency of screenshots is once in 60 seconds. Still, it improves to once in 15 seconds when the network uses high-value communication applications like Outlook or instant messaging apps. One of Flame's modules switches on the system's internal microphones and secretly records conversations over Skype. It also scans for Bluetooth-enabled devices in the vicinity and accesses names and phone numbers from the contacts folder. Finally, the malware sends the information to the hackers through a covert SSL channel. In addition, Flame has a sniffer component for scanning the infected machine local network traffic to collect username and password transmitted across the network. It enables the hackers to access administrative accounts and gain high-level privileges to other devices. Interestingly enough, Flame has a Viper module for transferring stolen data from the infected machines to the hacker command and control servers. So what makes Flame challenging to detect and ends more dangerous than Stuxnet or Dukyu? And Iranian news reports indicated that the Viper or Viper program infecting their oil company machines were designed to delete massive volumes of data from the infected systems. However, Kaspersky examined one such system and did not find any trace of flame malware on the disk. The ability to cover its tracks and make itself challenging to detect distinguishes flame from other malwares. The use of the LUA language for writing malware is uncommon the large size of the toolkit itself make it complicated. The recording of data through microphones and Bluetooth was novel. Now, here comes the main questions of when Flame was created. And Flame's creators were clever hackers who changed the file creation dates to prevent any investigator from establishing the truth of its time of creation. However, records show that the Flame project was created sometime around 2010, with many of its models in 2011 or 2012. So maybe earlier versions of Flame could have existed, but there is no evidence to confirm this. Who and why would anyone create malware such as Flame? Generally, malware creators can be classified into three categories activists, cyber criminals, and state nations. Now, Flame does not steal your bank information and money. It does not use simple hacking tools generally used by activists. Therefore, you can exclude cyber criminal and activists from the list, in my mind at least, leaving us with nation states. If you study the geographical spread of flame, you will find that it's around Iran, Sudan, Egypt, North Africa, and states in the Middle East. Besides, its complexity strengthens our suspicion of the involvement of state actors. However, like Stuxnet and Dukyu, no one knows its origin for certain. So why would someone unleash flame on these nations' network systems? Initially, it seems that Flame looked for intelligence like emails, messages, documents, discussions, etc., etc., etc. However, there are no signs of Flame targeting any specific industrial installation, critical infrastructure, or SCADA devices. Therefore, it leads us to believe that this attack toolkit is designed for cyber espionage. Remember, we had referred to Flame as a parallel creation to Stuxnet and Dukyu. 
If Flame were to be so different from Stuxnet and Dukyu, how could it be parallel? While Stuxnet used the tilted platform, Flame is different. However, the use of the autorun.inf infection methodology and the exploitation of the principle of vulnerability used by Stuxnet indicates that Flame and Stuxnet authors were on the same wavelength, if we say so. The golden rule of espionage is to have multiple alternative plans ready for operation if one fails. Similarly, Flame seems to be the perfect backup option if Stuxnet and Dukyu were discovered. Moreover, Flame was based on an entirely different philosophy compared to Stuxnet and Dukyu. Hence, it can continue unhindered even if other research projects are discovered. So wrapping it up, cyber warfare is a crucial aspect of a Cold War. Iran developing its nuclear capability can have dangerous repercussions for the US. Hence, introducing malware like Stuxnet Worm, Dukyu and Flame to slow down Iran nuclear weapon development program is a critical component of US-Israeli stealth strategy, according to the Washington Post. It is impossible to ignore the patterns and chronology of Stuxnet, Dukyu and Flame. While Stuxnet damaged machines used in the nuclear enrichment process, Dukyu and Flame infiltrated their computer systems and stole sensitive data. Thus, we can conclude that Flame is maybe the final and the most dangerous part of the Stuxnet, Dukyu, Flame trilogy. These malicious pieces of software indeed proved that shedding blood is not necessarily required to win wars today. If you survived until now, thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed and it was insightful for you. If you like this video, please subscribe and push the like button and see you in the next video. Thank you very much. Bye.